thank you all for sticking around. You are dedicated, and we appreciate it. Um, so I'm Justin Borgman. I'm the VP and GM of the Teradata Center for Hadoop. Uh, I came to Teradata almost two years ago through the acquisition of a company called Hadapt, which I was the founder and CEO of. Hadapt was a SQL engine for Hadoop. Uh, we were actually one of the first companies to kind of pioneer that idea. Um, back then, uh, of course, uh, Facebook was doing it with Hive, but Hive was very slow. So our, our whole idea was to basically bring real sort of uh, uh, performance and functionality of an analytic database to Hadoop. And that's what we did with Hadapt until we were acquired. Now I run uh, the Center for Hadoop, which is basically our new Hadoop products division. And uh, part of what we'll talk about today is kind of how the data warehousing industry itself is changing, uh, and certainly Teradata is uh, at the center of that, I think. Um, but uh, Kurt, why don't you introduce sure. yourself? Uh, my name is Kurt Brown. I manage the data infrastructure team. So Caitlin Smallow <laughs> talked earlier. We're kind of like opposite ends of the spectrum. So she does interesting, crazy analyses, and I provide the infrastructure to do it. Um, and those, those technologies are all over the map. It's big data technologies and normal size technologies, like Presto, Hadoop, Spark, uh, Teradata, Redshift, Tableau, MicroStrategy. So we have a, a whole suite of different tools. Awesome. So I, I thought um, maybe to kick things off, um, I'd love to hear about kind of what the technologies are that you use at Netflix. Because I think one of the things that I've learned over the last uh, four or five years is uh, there seems to be kind of two great changes going on in, in, this, in this industry. One is driven by the emergence of open source uh, software um, and how you know great internet companies are basically creating great infrastructure software as a byproduct of their business, um, of which you use a lot of open source software, and then also the emergence of the cloud as a way of deploying all of this infrastructure. And you guys have been a big and early user of Amazon, so I'd love to hear about some of those choices and, and what you guys sure, use. Sure, sure. Um, so I don't know if you know it, but. Virtually all of Netflix is in the Amazon cloud, so we have no data center presence at all, um, which is pretty crazy for how big we are. Um, we do have a little bit that's outside of Amazon in that we have a content delivery network. So if you ever heard of Akamai or Level 3 or Limelight, like that's the kind of thing that we used to use those services, but we got too big um, to sort of fit in their pipes. So we created our own content delivery network. So the, the actual movie bits and bytes are not streamed from Amazon, which is a common misconception. But all the control plane stuff, all the data, all the authentication, all the data analysis, all that stuff happens in Amazon. So um, and then the technologies, I mentioned a few of them. So some, some key tenets for us. Since we're in Amazon, if you don't know Amazon that well, then I'll, I'll give a quick primer on a couple of things. We use S3, which is Amazon's like infinitely scalable um, data store to put all of our analytic data. Everything I could say is probably in quotes for this entire, because it's like a little not true. Um, <laughs> so we have about 40 petabytes in, in S3 right now that we use for analytical purposes. Every day we get another 700 billion events that flow into S3 from our various application servers. And that's things like, what's the quality of experience you're getting as a customer? Um, are you a member? Are you not? Did you hit play on a movie so that we can create great recommendations, which Caitlin talked about? Um, cool. And so uh, have you guys always been in the cloud? Or what prompted, what prompted that decision in the first place? Yeah. Um, so I've been at Netflix about six years. So I can't take credit for moving to the cloud. It was a little before my time. Um, but 2008, just a little bit actually, um, we had a data, we had a meltdown in our data center. So I don't know if you remember, or is anyone here a DVD subscriber for Netflix? Raise your hand if you are. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was. I, should say. Yeah. Yeah. I was too. I was too. <laughs> um, so back in the day, if you, if for the people who don't, who didn't raise their hand, we used to be a DVD company, um, but we're we're a lot more of a streaming company now. And the DVD days, you know, when we had it, we had a massive outage. It was about three days that we could we sh we shipped almost no discs out. And at the time, it fortunately wasn't completely catastrophic because a lot of people had discs at their home already, or maybe they were in the mail on the way, or you had three at a time. Um, but we knew at that time we were already very early in our streaming um, evolution, and we knew that we would be doomed. Like with streaming, it doesn't work that way. If it's down, it's down, and, and that's a terrible experience for your customers. So at that point, we're like, okay, what do, what's our next step? Like we know we know we're going to be a different company pretty soon, and we know we're going to need to grow. We're going to need to scale, despite what Josh said earlier. Like it is important to scale. Um, so, and at the time, there wasn't great, like the problem wasn't solved at the time. 
so the cloud was sort of the natural fit for us. It was, we, we knew we needed a multi, multi data center. We wanted technologies that would span multiple data centers within the actual application. So we moved to technologies like Cassandra. We moved away from Oracle into Cassandra. So, you know, for example, this is the data store behind um, are you a member or are you not? And just about everything at Netflix. So this isn't for analytics. This is for operational online stuff. And with Cassandra, you have a copy of the data in basically three different data centers within the cloud. We shouldn't know they're a data center, but it, that's essentially what it is. So it was basically like a rethinking of our architecture to move towards distributed systems and patterns so that we wouldn't face like something like that again. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the common, I guess, hesitations or reservations about for, for many companies to move to the cloud has been security. Mm -hmm. Was that a concern or how did you guys kind of rationalize or get around that point? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously it's very important to us like everyone else. I think the sort of turning the question on the head is how good are most companies at security? I mean, if you compare how good they are versus a company that has the economy of scale to have to figure this problem out for a lot of different people. So I think from that perspective, like Amazon is gonna do a really good job at the high level of security. And then when you wanna talk about the low level, it doesn't matter if you're in a data center in Amazon, if you wanna leave the door open, you're gonna leave the door open. So um, that wasn't a driving consideration. I will say that in terms of PCI compliance and billing and all that, like those are the last systems to move. And we had our final like turn it all off in January and that those are the last systems. Mm -hmm. Um, just one other question I was, I was thinking about as you were saying that. I mean, you guys are a huge Amazon customer. I don't, are you the, the biggest? Well, certainly one of the biggest, if not the biggest. I, I couldn't say. And okay. I, but very large. Yep. Um, uh, you know, I, I've heard this concern now from, from, from a few customers that are starting to get into the cloud where uh, they almost have this concern of, of vendor lock-in, of being locked into one cloud. Yep. And, you know, uh, are, uh, has that been a consideration? Would you... Sure. split things up onto Google or Azure or sure. something else. Sure, I mean, it's a common question for us, yeah. and there's some, I talked to an Azure guy earlier in Microsoft, so sorry for the <laughs> answer I'm about to say. Um, the, the reality is like Amazon is just so much farther ahead than other cloud providers. If it was a very equal playing field, then it would be like, okay, you know, what should we do? Should we hedge our bets? I mean, the reality is that um, Amazon isn't just like one data center and we've chosen one data center and we're like taking that risk that we had before. It's all over the world. There's tons of diff diff different data centers. They have best practices that hopefully they follow most of the time where like per region is where they're supposed to uh, roll out code and not do it across regions at the same time. Um, we actually have our architecture set up now where all of Netflix can shift all around the world so we can serve all of the US out of Europe or we can solve all of the US out of East Coast or West Coast and sort of shape that traffic. And part of that was because we did have an, an issue where a region went down at a certain point and a streaming company, we can't have that. So I think it's, there's, no never, there's no never say never, but it's like the reality is we have a great relationship with Amazon um, they, their DNA fits us pretty well. And then until there's a really compelling reason to do otherwise. And, you know, of course, I mean, people say, oh, well, they're a competitor of ours with, with Amazon um, video. But the nice thing about Amazon is they're competitors with themselves on so many different facets. Like mm -hmm. Teradata just went into Amazon. Yep. Competitor with Redshift or the Amazon Marketplace for, for buying products. Like that's their DNA is sort of like dog eat dog, which from a customer perspective is nice. Cool. Um, as long as it's their dogs eating their dogs, not, <laughs> not us. So. Right. Um, what, so what role does Hadoop uh, in particular, and, and I guess maybe other open source technologies as well, uh, play for you in, in that overall kind of architecture? You mentioned you know, certainly some of the, the projects and tools that you use, but um, you know, how central is that to your data infrastructure and, and kind of how important is it? Yep, um, it's huge, no pun intended, or sort of a pun intended there. Um, <laughs> it, so basically, like, we have too much data to process with any system that is not very scalable. Um, so basically, like, we had no choice. I mean, when I started, um, I started managing the Hadoop team in, like, 2011, and it was very small scale, relatively speaking. I remember looking at some old slides, and it was like we had a four petabyte data warehouse or something like that, or maybe it was even less at the time, I think it was. And it's just, it's just grown and grown and grown and grown. So we need a solution that can handle it. And then the beauty of something like Hadoop is, um, obviously you have to pay for the hardware. Like there's no escaping that no matter what. But you, at a certain point, like it's prohibitively expensive or can be to use, depending on the vendor license that is there. 
And even with EMR, we ended up negotiating a site license with them so that we don't have to think about scaling anymore. Like we have to think about it from hardware, but we have no choice. Like you have to scale to do what you want to do as a business. So open source is, is huge from both a cost perspective. And the other thing that we found over time is that when you start hitting these like really big data challenges, which fortunately not everybody hits, things break, all sorts of things break. And the beauty of being an open source um, is that you can fix it. And it's, that's always a tension point with vendors is that they understandably have a queue of work that needs to be done. And they've got a lot of customers. And each individual customer is like, but this is really important to us. And they've got to sort it around. And you may not pay them the most money or whatever. But with open source, you can roll up your sleeves and you can fix it yourself if you have the expertise. And the way I kind of think of it, it is it's sort of, it's in some ways invalidated the buy versus build argument. It's sort of, well, you get both. You, you don't have to build it all from scratch, which is a tragedy. And a lot of companies seem to want to do that anyway, even though it's already been built, I guess to Josh's point earlier on. Um, so it's like, but there's so much goodness there. It's not all good. I mean, you hit lots of bugs and things, but you have a, a platform that you can build on top of and fix bugs that are unique to your specific needs. So you can roll up your sleeves, but, and then this you know, ties a little into the talk, is that, and just for, for clarity, is we actually, we use Teradata as a database, but we don't use their, their Presto open source stuff. So I'm not a paid shill or anything like mm -hmm. that for, for Presto, um, which we're talking about a little bit. Um, I'm not a paid shill, period. <laughs> I refuse to do that. Um, so, uh, but it, the, the other side of it is, for a lot of companies, a vendor does make a lot of sense because they have SLAs and they don't want to roll up their sleeves or it's not the best use of their time. And if you're not at a certain scale or you don't have like really quirky things that are breaking all the time, then you know, if you can pay someone to take care of it and it pretty much just runs itself, it's not necessarily a bad deal. So you know, it's kind of like we don't actually, because we, we, started, we picked up Presto, which is, we haven't really talked about it too much, but a couple of years ago. So we've been using it for so long that we have expertise. But a lot of other companies, like I, I believe in Presto. If you don't know what Presto is, basically it's a, it's a SQL engine on big data. And it's faster than Spark, it's faster than Hive. It's, you know, it's really good for interactive analysis and we've been using it for about two years. It's, it came out of Facebook, it's open sourced. They still own the project. It's not, a, it's not on Apache, it's on GitHub, but it's open source, so anyone can take that code. I think I just gave a really long answer to your question. That's no, okay. So we'll, we'll go over to the, to the no, next one. That's, I'm always happy to plug Presto. So okay. we, we've gotten behind Presto ourselves, which uh, maybe, maybe I'll talk about a little bit more in terms of kind of how Teradata is adapting to this new world. But, um, I, I am curious though, uh, you know, you mentioned that there are kind of uh, use cases even within Netflix to use proprietary software. Mm -hmm. um, so so my, my first big philosophical question for you uh, is, will there always be? And, you know, do you, you know, does, does that at some point get replaced also by open source software? So I presumably, you know, one of the reasons you use Teradata today is it's much faster than you know, what you can get in terms of interactive performance, even from something like Presto mm -hmm. today. But certainly that open source community um, is, is constantly advancing and, and making dramatic improvements. And even Hive today is much better than where it was, you know, five years ago. Yep. Um, you know, how do you see that future playing out? Yeah, I mean, there's like the, there's what I would want, like the idealism sort of world, and then there's the reality. So idealistically, like, yeah, I would love everything to be open source. I mean, when I, again, f go back six years ago, like, sure, we used Java and Linux and a little bit of Hadoop. So there was some light use of open source, but now, six years later, it's, it's crazy. I mean, like, we open source a lot of software. We use open source, like, throughout our, our company. There are places where, you know, we're using SaaS tools and things that aren't, aren't open source. Um, but, and then in some ways, it's not like, you know, it's not like I want to get in there and tinker and change everything. Like, if it just works, that's great. I think what open source, what I really like about open source is that it changes the nature of relationship with a vendor. Mm -hmm. because you don't have to stick with them. So the worst part about you get, you like you finally sign that, that contract and, and then you get even worse, you get a ton of code into their systems and then contract negotiation comes up and you're, you're pretty much hosed. Like, and they know you're hosed, you know? And, and it's like, so it just creates this, but then they know you're not hosed forever and they know you talk to other people too. <laughs> so it's this weird sort of dance, which I don't particularly like, and I have to do it all the time, as I, or I used to have to do it as an infrastructure owner, but now with open source, I don't have to do it as much. Or either I don't have to do it at all, 
like in the case for us with Presto, because there's no one we're paying. Um, it's just open source technology that we happen to be using. But then there's, there's other software that we're using that, you know, or other companies, let's say, that are Cloudera or Hortonworks, that they might work with them. And it could make a lot of sense with them. But the nice thing is that they can leave those companies if they want, and they don't lose all their code, or they're not locked out of continuing to run the system that's been running perfectly fine all along. So now it may, it's more like it's a marriage that both, well, even the vendor on even more has to make work as opposed to we know you have you, we have you over a barrel. So I think that that's one of the reasons I really like open source. And I, it doesn't mean that I really want to tinker with everything. Like I really don't want, if someone solved the problem, I don't want to solve that problem. There's plenty of other problems. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really interesting point, the point about the leverage that the customer gains mm -hmm. by, by engaging open source. And, uh, and certainly I think the impact of that to the vendor side is, uh, is margin compression. And, and you, you see this <laughs> across the database industry right now, uh, Oracle, IBM, uh, certainly Teradata as well, where that, that leverage um, you know, impacts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course, it's good for the, good for the customer. Um, I guess my question for you is, uh, where do you see um, these kind of you know, more traditional you know, data management companies that have proprietary products um, adding value in this new world as, as it evolves? Yep. Um, I, I'd say that there's always a place for someone who does good work. And I think that what a company has an advantage of is that if they are focused and doing something and doing it really, really well, and it's something that people need, then they have a unique differentiator versus, say, an Amazon who's trying to do so many things that if a Tableau comes along and they're just focused on the, one of these things, something like QuickSight, which is Amazon's you know, new solution, it's going to take a while for them to get there. And it's going to be even more like a question of how much does Amazon want to fund that project? And they've got a lot of other projects to fund. So that's the opportunity, I think, that remains for these other companies is how much appetite does the particular cloud provider or ecosystem provider have to really invest in a particular area mm -hmm. versus somebody else. And then even if you want to do it, it's like, do you have the expertise, the sort of uniqueness? Do you have the allure as a company to get the best of the best that really want to work on like, you know, cutting edge visualization or something like that? So I think the, the real, the, the, the opportunity, which is whether it's using open source or whether it's a, a big company or whatever, is that they can specialize on something and do it in hopefully a great way. And if they don't, then they go away. And then somebody else does it instead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that, that you say that. I think, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do uh, to, to wrestle with this, and I think the entire industry is kind of going through an innovator dilemma type of challenge, I know we were talking about this before, um, is to try to embrace, actually, that uh, transition that I think is going on in the industry. And that's one of the things that we've been doing with Presto, which, which Kurt mentioned before, and that was actually taking... Uh, our, our team and our IP from Hadapt, which Teradata paid money to acquire, and actually contributing that towards the Presto project. So we now work with Facebook advancing the Presto project, and our goal is to hopefully make that the best open source SQL engine for Hadoop uh, and really push that forward. And our, our feeling is, and, and, and we also happen to be fortunate that we're the only ones providing support at this point for, for Presto. So our hope is that we can kind of uh, expand the, the market opportunity for Teradata, where Teradata traditionally serves kind of the largest companies in the world, uh, and hopefully uh, broaden that footprint and be, be relevant in this kind of new world. Um, uh, but I'm curious, um, you know, what do you think, uh, you know, you mentioned Oracle actually earlier in, in, your, uh, in your talk about how uh, you moved away from Oracle to, to Cassandra. Um, do you see anything on, on more, that's more the kind of the operational side, the OLTP side, do you see, um, do you see the, the vendors in that space doing anything to, uh, to sort of uh, try to woo you back? Because I'm, I'm sure that was a decent sized account that somebody lost at Oracle. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, this is out of my, my area of expertise, but I mean, at a high level, I think I can answer the question in a different way, which is just Cassandra works well for us. I mean, we were kind of lucky in a way with Cassandra. I don't, I don't know how deep techy everyone is in this room, but um, so Cassandra actually came out of Facebook. A lot of stuff has come out of Facebook, mm -hmm. and it never really worked that well for Facebook, and then Twitter took it on, and it never really worked very well for Twitter. And then we took it on, 
And we kind of hit it right at about the right time that enough people had invested enough energy and then we put more energy into it. And then Datastax came along as a company, which I guess ties back into having an enterprise vendor makes a difference. It's sort of like graduation for some open source projects that people, especially bigger companies, they need someone to support. And it was, yeah. you know, it wasn't like Datastax was doing a lot for us in the early days, but you know, it was another big person that was in the community was Cassandra. So, you know, I think that the answer really is just Cassandra has worked really well for us. It's a very good distributed, fast um, system that scales. Um, you know, the reason it's not in my team is that we do data analytics, and that's not what it's good for. It's good for point queries where you know what kind of questions are going to be asked, and it's really quick response time, whereas the stuff I do is more like batch analytics or major data processing, um, and you don't know what the questions are ahead of time. Okay. Um, so uh, that leads me to another question. You know, we, we talked about how I think the shift towards open source is certainly putting some, some margin pressure on the, the traditional vendor, vendors, but you also have a whole host of, of open source support vendors. You mentioned data stacks. Obviously, there's Cloudera, Hortonworks, MapR. Um, do you think that they can actually build uh, large businesses, uh, profitable businesses, doing this, right? Yep. And, and certainly... Uh, Hortonworks is the only one public today. Um, their financials are uh, not showing profitability uh, today or anytime soon. But do you think that model works? Um, um, well, I, I can't. I'm not an economist or or an investor, fortunately. So I, I can't say for sure. Like pure dollars, like that's going to be depending on how they execute. But do I see a place that they could make money? Um, and I think yeah. I think that's back to there are a lot of companies that are going to need a bunch of things these companies could do. Well, let me start with saying they probably don't want to do it. You know, it's back to like if a company can lock you in and, and have IP and proprietary and all that, like that's, that's a preferred world for them probably. But it's just what I like about open source is just not the reality. And hopefully it's becoming less of the reality. It's still a lot more the reality than I'd like. So, but it's like, okay, so now you have these companies. They are in the open source field. So what can they do with that? And there's a bunch of things they can do. One is, you know, the, the obvious is something like training, you know, which a lot of them do. Like we just Databricks, we got a bunch of training for them on Spark recently. Um, then you kind of step up a little bit and you say, um, like, uh, support. So things break. Companies have SLAs. They might not have the expertise in house. Like there's somebody they can go, someone they can ring the neck of to say, you got to fix this problem right now. So I think that's a very valuable thing, especially as these technologies proliferate. Then uh, a play that a lot of them are doing is they're, they're creating add-ons. So they'll be like, here's how you manage your, your open source suite. And that's not really open source, or maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, but it's, it's this value add add-on that none of the other vendors are doing. So you're, you're, even if it is open source, you're a little more locked into that vendor. But mm -hmm. hopefully they're providing enough value that it's worth it for you to use it. And then ideally, if it went away, you could still use that technology. So like, there are some Hadoop vendors that start slipping into its it's pretty proprietary, and honestly, like even if it's a little bit better, I'll steer away from that because I don't want that lock-in. At least right. you know there's a, there's a happy balance. And then the last thing, which is doesn't happen as much, but it, it certainly does happen. Actually, it probably does happen quite a bit. Is that um, you might want features that features that are specific to you, and that kind of gets to what I said as a pain point before. You know, and it's nice that you can roll up your sleeves, but it's also nice if you can make someone else roll up your sleeve, their sleeves. You just you know pay them a little money, and they they add a patch to it. And it might even be easier for them to do it than it would have been in the old school world. Because the old school world, they had to like package it in with this huge release that everybody under the sun's gonna get and has to go through all these data quality checks. In some cases, they could just make a patch and give it to you because you have your own you know, um, uh, compilable set of code and they don't even have to worry about it breaking other customers. So all those things are opportunities for dollar signs, I think, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I wanna be mindful of time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, what about uh, platform as a service? Do you see uh, a world in which uh, you know, DBMS is being given back to the professionals <laughs> you know, to, to write the, the DBMS engine and, uh, and, and really large companies use it as a SQL interface alone? Are you saying, 
Can you be more specific what you mean? Like you SQL in the cloud, like okay. what SQL Azure, SQL Azure DW, I'm sure these guys are working on it. Or yeah, I mean, I think it. perfect world, like the higher the level of abstraction that continues to meet your needs, the better. Um, it's only when it gets abstracted to a high enough level and you, if something doesn't meet your needs that you actually wish it was a lower level. So I think over time, that just totally makes sense. Like at the end of the day, if you could do like, you know, BigQuery is, is going down that road. Like if you can just say, this is what I want to execute and you're blissfully unaware of the resources or maybe it's just a dollar, or a, the decision point around dollars versus instances that you're spinning up, like that's very attractive. And I think databases will go there at, at, a, at a certain point. Uh, big data will go there at a certain point where it is really more, and, th and I think that's another advantage of the cloud is they actually have all those hardware resources and they can share it across the different customers. Hi, um, I had two questions. One actually for you, Kurt. Um, we, had, we spoke about the S3 buckets that you're using for, um, for your storage. Uh, there is a lot of discussion going around um, storage, like which is DAS, which is what Hadoop model works on, which is direct at attached storage, versus the NAS and, and the bucket storage. So um, do you have a view on what the future is, which is between DAS and NAS? Um, I don't know about DAS and NAS, but I'll say that we really like, I mean, we the decoupling of processing and storage is just the way it has to be at a certain point. It's it's very illogical, but it's very practical that they're together right now, I mean, tr mostly from a performance profile characteristics. What we do with Hadoop is like S3 is the backend is very decoupled. It's actually, S3 is its own distributed system that you're, you don't have to worry about so much. Um, and then you have Hadoop, which is its own distributed system. So, and then given that it's usually bigger data and bigger questions, the sort of latency between them, it's not quite as big a deal. But I think over time, like making that faster and faster and faster, so it feels local is gonna be important. And I think with Amazon, at, you know, at a certain point, or for any of these um, cloud providers, they will get to a world where local disk is, is a, a theoretical concept. It's, it's all detached and you'll mix and match and there won't be a preset instance size. It'll be more characteristics that you want. And then they'll just kind of glue it together with fast networks. And so, sorry, um, time is way too fresh. <laughs> yes, a question for Kurt. So a few years ago, if we want to do uh, analytics at scale, we will go to EMR and fire up some cluster. But nowadays, from, from Amazon and from other vendors, they have now the API for machine learning and for analytics. I just want to see what's your view on that. Is, is it going to be a trend or is they are not good enough? I mean, I think that there will be a place for those and there'll be more and more of a place for those as they get better and better and better. I mean, the, the reality, like just about everything that I've talked about is none of it's as good as we'd like it to be. So, you know, like in some cases we'll be, we'll use like database services or something like that to handle specific things and then we'll have to have clusters on our own. So I think like, you know, early days for Amazon's machine learning thing, um, Google has some pretty good machine learning things as well. And then for us, I would say it's going to be mostly one more tool in the toolkit versus being the toolkit, at least for quite, a, quite some time. Thanks a lot. That was awesome. I really enjoyed that. Um, my question is, I am an advocate for open source. I, I believe in it, but then if I am Netflix or I am Teradata, I'm probably not going to open source my secret sauce, mm. right? Because then you're basically commoditizing your own business. But as you deploy more open source here and there, you're kind of still doing that because it makes my ability, who am not Netflix or Teradata, to spool up a competitor for yep. you, right? So then the question for me is, uh, I guess as a little bit of a skeptic, are, are, is what's becoming open source, it's like, it's like the US government, they're not gonna open source the secret jet plane that's, you know, yeah. whatever, going to, um, you know, m make other countries be able to compete with them, right? So then, um, is Netflix or Teradata worried that in the long run, you're kind of commoditizing yourself by uh, so deploying open source? I think you asked like three different <laughs> questions in oh. there. Uh, All good ones, so. <laughs> Yeah. But one is we have no nefarious internal open, non-open source version and we're giving you the garbage that we, we want you to like sabotage your businesses. So it's, it's, it's all well-meaning what we're putting out there. 
Um, I think that for vendors, the answer is that they have no choice to a certain degree because if people can walk where they want to go, um, they do have a choice, but it's a diminishing choice over time. And then I think that what makes it possible, so I think all three questions I'm going to try to answer. Um, what makes it possible for us is what we are open sourcing isn't necessarily our secret sauce. You know, it's like, yeah, it might be a little bit of a leg up to you, like a, a little token, but then other people are giving that token to us and other people and other people, and, and we're getting so much more out of it than we're giving back. So really what it comes down to is how are people using those technologies? So like groups like Caitlin's group that is doing experimentation and you know that not all of that's getting, even the infrastructure might get open source, but it's sort of more the people that are putting it into practice, and that's not really open sourceable at the end of the day. So I don't think we worry about it as much um, because it's, it's how you put it into practice. I'll just add maybe 10 seconds, and I, I know we're wrapping up. I, I think, uh, you know, Kurt's absolutely right. Obviously, they're not going to open source their secret sauce. Facebook doesn't open source their secret sauce. But what's interesting is what they open source is sort of the secret sauce of a whole industry of vendors that used to make these things for people, right? And so that is, is kind of an whole interesting dynamic. And I think that's where um, today, uh, you know, certainly the technologies that Teradata has built are much higher performance. Uh, they have 35 years of, of development built into them. But I think the, the long-term implications of this are real. And I think that's, that's really the crux of kind of the innovator dilemma problem that I think the whole industry is experiencing. And I think vendors can either be in denial about that or kind of face it head on and try to figure out where their business lies you know, 20 years from now versus where it does today. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.